I'm moving around. I hope you all don't mind. Um, because sometimes when I stand out in the middle, I'm getting a shot in my knee this week, so I should not be hobbling after Thursday. But, um, and I do want to say a word about standing in the pulpit. I've stood in the lectern, and it was my first day coming down here on July 1st. I was driving from West Virginia early, early, early in the morning, and I had a bit of sadness because I was thinking that my husband, who died nearly three years ago now, would not know the church I was in. And then I remembered when I stood up in the lectern to read scripture that in 2003, my mom and dad reaffirmed their 50th, on their 50th anniversary, they reaffirmed their wedding vows. I got to do that. Not many people get to do their parents' wedding. But I got to do their reaffirmation. And my husband, along with my sister and brother-in-law, were liturgists. So my husband has stood at the lectern there. So today I'm moving to the pulpit just for a little bit more stability. We're picking up almost where we left off last week. We're talking again about treasure and where our treasure is in the 12th chapter of Luke. There was a little passage in between that was left out. And I'm going to read beyond today's lectionary in the Protestant church to include the whole of the story that begins at verse 32. And these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, Blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or for everyone? And the Lord then said, who is faithful and prudent manager whom his master will put in charge of the slaves to give them their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Truly I tell you, he will put that one in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says to himself, my master's delayed in coming, and if he begins to beat the other slaves, men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. That slave who knew what his master wanted but did not prepare himself or do what was wanted will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what he deserved a beating will receive a light beating. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to ask a question now. It's not rhetorical, so I want you to answer back, OK, out loud, not just in your head. If you were to become a superhero, if you could just become a superhero, I don't want to know which superhero you would become. I want to know what superpower you would want to have. Invisibility. Invisibility and we will not ask you to expand on that. <laughs> what else? Healing, OK. What else? Flying. Flying. That's mine. I would love to fly. I think that's why I like birds so much. Anybody else have one? John? Water into wine. Water into wine. <laughs> and again, we will not ask for, OK, are you getting a thumbs up over here? Yes, yes, yes. Teleportation. Ooh, 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 ooh. Some of you are like, yeah, I wouldn't mind being able to teleport. Move from, I wouldn't mind being able to teleport from West Virginia to Cockeysville, Maryland. It would save me some time. But I want you to hold on to those thoughts until we look a little bit more at the gospel lesson we have. Like we said, it's another, another lesson about treasure in heaven. This time Jesus says, don't make purses for yourselves here that will wear out. Now let me ask you again, and you can answer that back out loud too. How do you keep a purse from wearing out? 
Don't use it. Amen. Don't stuff it so full that it gets stretched out of shape. Offload your possessions. Do almsgiving. Almsgiving is a particular type of giving. It means specifically to give to the poor. And Jesus says that line that we've heard so many times, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. I was ordained by Bishop Joseph Hughes Yackel, who is still a force in my life. And much of what I do right in ministry, I owe to him. He used to say all the time, don't tell me what you believe. You can tell me what you believe all day long. Show me your checkbook and your credit card statements, and I'll tell you what you believe. And that is absolutely true, because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. But Jesus is, in this section we read, comparing discipleship to servants who diligently wait for their master's return, meaning that they're going about his business because he's been delayed. That doesn't take them from the task at hand. They keep doing what they should be doing. This really is a parable about the end times. Now you have to remember that the Gospels were written well after the time of our Lord's resurrection, at a time when a lot of Christians were feeling persecuted and threatened. Rome was still hovering over them and controlling them. They did not have control of the land that God had promised them. And it was written at a time when people were expecting Jesus' imminent return. They were looking for him to come any day to restore the kingdom to Israel. But we need to remember, too, that parables are often imperfect illustrations. Jesus is not giving a play-by-play -play description of what the sweet by-and-by -by is going to look like, because that would be too easy. Parables are designed and written and told to make us think. Sometimes maybe even they're created to make us squirm a little bit. So Jesus compares the coming of the Son of Man. He's talking about the time of his death, his resurrection, and his second coming. They're not quite sure, listening, Peter and the other disciples and the crowd that had gathered. They're not quite sure that that's his context. But he says the Son of Man, when he comes, is going to come like a thief in the night. Not like a birthday party surprise where everybody goes, surprise, this is one that's more like, uh-oh. I had a friend in seminary who had a bumper sticker that said, Jesus is coming, look busy. <laughs> we can't deny that there is a sense of warning in the passage about what we're to be doing when the Son of Man returns. So it's no wonder Peter asks, is this a parable that's meant for us or for those other people out there? Most likely, Jesus is speaking to those who are going to lead his church in his absence between the time of his resurrection and the time of his return, which happens to be the time that we're still living in. And leaders have to take the responsibility very seriously because leaders in the church will be held to a higher standard. Now, if you're sitting there going, so glad I'm not a pastor, don't think that because this is not written for bishops or televangelists, or the person standing in the pulpit. This applies to the people who sit in the pews as well, because we are all held to a higher standard. Now, some people don't think so. Some people, I've actually been told, we need you to lead a moral life so we don't have to. And I remember the story that I was told by an older member of one of the congregations I served. He and his wife had a Christmas party every year. They invited the whole church. The whole church showed up. They had a big house. The entire congregation was there, including the pastor and his wife. And at the party, they had a bowl of eggnog that was full of bourbon, more bourbon than egg, more bourbon than nog. They also had soft drinks and water and iced tea and hot tea and coffee and things like that. And a woman came storming up to the host, and she said, I want the superintendent's phone number, and I want it right now. He said, what do you want to do, invite the superintendent to the party? No, I want to talk to the superintendent about that pastor's wife. She was drinking eggnog. I saw her boldly drinking eggnog. And he looked at the woman and he said, now, Reba, I might be tempted to give you that number if it weren't for the eggnog mustache you have on right now. She wanted to make sure the pastor's wife and the pastor weren't drinking the eggnog so she could feel better about drinking some herself. So we've got to accept the fact that Jesus is talking to each of us. 
we are all called to diligently be waiting for Christ's return, which means that we're supposed to be going about Christ's business, not our own business. We're supposed to be going about the business of Christ because there is not anyone here or anyone anywhere who bears the name of Jesus Christ who is not called to feed the poor, to lift up the fallen, to comfort and counsel the despairing, to work for justice and shalom among people. That is our job. And the consequences when we don't do it can be quite severe. More so for those who know and refuse to do than those who don't know as much. Now, a couple appointments ago, I served a church that had three sets of identical twins. The youngest were about five years old, six years old, something like that. And they had a brother who was about eight or nine. Busy, busy family. I was doing the children's message that morning, and I called the kids up. And up comes one of the twins, and she's got overalls and boots and a flannel shirt on. I looked at the other twin. She was wearing a bathing suit with a tutu, no stockings, enough makeup to cover the face of every woman, man, and child in that church, and flip-flops. I looked at her and I said, Mommy's visiting me, Ma, isn't she? And she said, how'd you know? I said, Daddy let you dress himself, didn't he? Just then, her father raises up from the pew and just gives me a look like this. <laughs> After the service, his mother said to me, I cannot wait till their mother gets home. And I said, do you think she's going to get in trouble? She said, oh, no, but my nitwit son sure is. <laughs> those who know better are held to a higher standard than those who don't. But the key to understanding this whole lesson is found at the last line from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. Got to hear that one again, OK? From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen this quote attributed to John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I have heard this in graduation speeches and all kinds of speeches. And he actually did use the line in an address to the Joint Convention of the General Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1961. But he took it from Jesus. And if you're wondering what in the world superheroes and superpowers have to do with anything, it is that quote from Peter Parker's Uncle Ben. With great power comes great responsibility. How many superhero fans do we have? Are there any Spider-Man aficionados here this morning? Yeah, I, I, I know that's always going to be the case anymore. Isn't that really a restatement of what Jesus is saying? With great power comes great responsibility. Those to whom much has been given from them, much will be expected and required. Think a minute about superheroes. Do y'all have a favorite superhero? Somebody likes superheroes these days, or the Marvel movie Empire wouldn't be making so much money. Who are some of your favorite superheroes? You're afraid to say that, because you don't want people to know you read comic books or go to movies. Nobody's got a favorite superhero? Wonder Woman. OK, we got a feminist in the crowd. Who's your favorite? Supergirl. OK, we got a couple of feminists here. Anybody else? Think about when superheroes started to come into play in American culture. Superman, 1938. Captain America, 1941. And that other great superhero, Mighty Mouse, 1941. Why would you think that that would be the era of the development of these superhuman characters who were able to do great things. The rise of the Nazi regime, war, depression. At times when people feel vulnerable and scared and hurt, you need somebody who's a little bit bigger than life and stronger than you are. From everyone to whom much has been given, much more will be required. That's the last line of the lesson. But in order to really fully understand what we have been given, you got to go back to the first line, spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples. One of my favorite lines in all of scripture, 
Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The kingdom. What are we given with the kingdom? Again, not a rhetorical question. What are we given when we're given God's kingdom? Eternal life. Amen. What else are we given? Unending love. What else are we given? Hmm? The gift of faith. We're given the gift of faith. We're given forgiveness of our sins. We're given a fresh start. We're given a clean slate. We are given power from on high. We are gifted by the Holy Spirit working in and through us. We are not empowered by radioactive spider bites. We are not empowered because we were born on Krypton and the yellow sun of Earth impacts our strength. We were not given these gifts because of gamma radiation, vibranium, or infinity stones. Yes, I do know what's going on in the world right now. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit, so you don't need a shield, you don't need a Batmobile, you don't need any of Tony Stark's gadgets, you don't need the technology, and by the same token, we do not need wealth, we do not need power, we do not need warfare, we do not need weaponry, we don't need any of the tools that the kingdom of this earth values because we have been given the kingdom of God, which is eternal, which is not a possibility among many. It is the reality that we are given to live in through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. With it comes power, and with that power comes great responsibility. So, what do we have to do? We have to be like Abraham. We have to seize onto the hope that is given us. Abraham was called when he was an old guy, and his wife was even older, and promised that through her, they were going to have descendants as many as the stars of heaven. And he picked up and he left just on the call itself. By faith, we are able to understand that God has given us a world and everything that fills it. By faith, we are able to step forward in fearless love toward the world. Maybe it's not 1938. Maybe it's not 1941. Maybe you feel more like Mickey Mouse than Mighty Mouse some days. But you have been called. You have been gifted. You have been empowered through the Holy Spirit to be a witness to the presence and power of Jesus Christ in the world here today. It is up to us to change this world. We are doing it at Epworth. We are changing the world one little bit at a time. I'm so sorry I'm going to miss Nathan and Anna's last Sundays with us. I have so been blessed by hearing about their ministry in Liberia. I'm also blessed to look at the list of school supplies and to look at the box that's already filled out there with school supplies. I'm blessed when I hear about the Baltimore County Christian Work Camp and a ramp that was built for a woman who was a prisoner in her own home who said when she came down that ramp for the first time she felt like a queen. I am blessed and I am empowered when I look at what the mission team did in North Carolina. I am awestruck by the fact that this group of ladies sitting in the parlor knitting has come up with 72,000, I'm not going to get over that, 72,000 baby hats. This is the work of superheroes, and you are my heroes. Please don't think I'm obsessed with Mr. Rogers. I know I talked about him a couple weeks ago when we looked at the Good Samaritan, but he was a colleague of mine in ministry, a good Presbyterian pastor. This is what he said. We live in a world in which we need to share responsibility. It's easy to say, it's not my child, not my community, not my world, not my problem. Then there are those who see the need and respond. I consider these people my heroes. That was Fred Rogers. I consider you my heroes. And I pray that when Christ returns, that he will find us diligently at work doing all that he commanded us to do, but more than that, doing all that through his spirit he has empowered us to do. Thanks be to God for the call, for the gifts, for the will to serve. Amen.